All right, so we're going to do an example of using deformation theory plasticity and incremental plasticity to see what kind of uh, strains we can calculate for a given stress tensor. So here is my starting stress tensor. Um, well, that's, that's where it's ending up. We're starting at zero stress and strain. And we're going to apply this stress tensor uh, units here in megapascals. And up on top, I have my material properties that I'm going to use. My modulus of elasticity, 200,000 megapascals. Poisson's ratio, uh, K and N for the ramberg good material description. And a yield stress value that I'm picking out of 150 megapascals. All right, and uh, this is actually a final exam question that I'm asking this term. And you're welcome to take a look at it. Let's talk about a little bit about the theory and what's going on with this problem, and then we'll get into the details uh, of, how, of how to solve this type of problem. So let's take a look first at the uniaxial stress-strain response that's, that can be calculated by the ramberg good coefficients and uh, exponent for this particular material. Form the ramberg good equation that uh, we're going to use is epsilon is equal to sigma over E plus sigma over K to the 1 over N power. All right, so I have a spreadsheet. Let me open that up. So what I've done here is I've taken that equation, I've put in our material constants, and I just plotted this uh, for different specific values of sigma in the elastic in the plastic parts. Now the elastic strain is the sigma over E, and the plastic part is the sigma over K to the 1 over N power. And so we see there's the plastic part, and there is my elastic part. And then by adding the elastic and plastic strains, we get our total strain. And this first curve that I've plotted here is the total strain response for these different stress levels. This next plot is the stress versus plastic strain. And the last one is stress versus elastic strain. And that's just to check to make sure we have a nice uh, uh, straight line response. It's a linear relationship. Let's zoom in on this just a little bit. Let's change these x values down here. And I guess we'll need to change the y values as well. Let's make this about 400. And uh, we can even go in further than this. Let's see. And so this 150 that I picked right here actually corresponds to a very small level of plastic strain. Looks like a plastic strain of about uh, 0.13 micro strain, which is very little. I probably could have gotten away with going up to 250 even. Now, in the incremental plasticity analysis, the yield strength that you use doesn't necessarily refer to the 0.2% offset yield stress or something like that, but it's the point in which you start to have some appreciable plastic strain that you just can't ignore. Um, it might be reasonable, depending on your coefficients, to take a, uh, a yield stress that corresponds to maybe uh, one micro strain, plastic strain, uh, one to five micro strain, depending on how, how close you want to get it. But uh, since this is an exponential function, that increases very quickly after this point. Uh, but we do have a region here uh, that is very near uh, negligible plastic strain. Of course, our ramberg gasket equation is a continuous yielding equation, and there are plastic strains everywhere. It's just that they're very tiny. So we're in here. Uh, here's 150. Um, that, that says 2 point, uh, point 0.215 micro strain. All right, so I just wanted to point that out, that this value, let me change colors. has a particular meaning when we're going to talk about our yield surface plasticity. 
All right, well, let's talk about the Henke equations first, or, or the total strain theory or the deformation theory of plasticity. In deformation theory of plasticity, we're going to make the jump from zero stress and strain to our stress tensor that we see there all in one jump. We can do that if we have what's called a proportional loading path, meaning that our stresses have to change uh, in the same ratios or different stress components over time until we reach our final strain uh, stress state. That would be called proportional loading. So if we had a monotonic function of time, all of these stress components change at the same monotonic function of time. All right, let me bring up those uh, equations and we'll write those down. All right, so these say that the plastic strains, epsilon ij plastic, these are tensor strains, is equal to 3 halves sij, the deviatoric stress tensor, uh, times epsilon p over sigma e, and we'll define what those terms mean here in just a second. Now, we derived this in class, and uh, I haven't made a, a YouTube video for that yet, but I will go through that derivation at some point. Uh, let's write down these terms. Now, Sij is our deviatoric stress, and the way we find that is we take sigma ij minus one-third sigma kk, chronic or delta ij, where we have uh, sigma kk in our index notation, meaning a, a summation. So that would be sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3, the three normal stresses or the trace of the stress tensor. Now, sigma e is the von Mises equivalent stress. We can find that in a couple different ways. In uh, undergraduate mechanics materials, I teach this equation. We have the differences among the normal stresses squared. plus six times each of the shearing stress terms squared. To the one-half power, and then divided by the square root of two. We can also write this in terms of deviatoric stresses. Uh, J2, this is why it's called J2 flow theory, J2 is equal to one-half Sij Sij. And when that is equal to one-third sigma naught squared, then we have uh, yielding. It's often expressed in a slightly different way. If we solve for sigma naught, which is the same as our equivalent, our von Mises stress, then we can write this as three halves Sij Sij. Now, Sij, Sij, I'll go ahead and write this out long ways once. Uh, it's a double sum over I and J. For our individual deviatoric stress components, we take each one of those components and square it and add them together. Might run out of room here. I'm going to continue down here. Now, with our stress tensor being symmetric under normal conditions, we can simplify this a little bit, but I do want to make a point that you have to account for all the terms. So it's not just S11, S12, S13, and then you go to S22. You also have to account for S21 squared in here as well. Uh, and let's see, we need this all taken to the one-half power. That's another way to compute the von Mises stress. Okay, so once we have the von Mises stress, we need to come up with the term epsilon sub p. That term epsilon sub p comes from our uniaxial stress strain response. If we have a stress versus plastic strain curve, Epsilon sub p is the corresponding plastic strain to that particular stress level. And for cases of multi-axial stress, we can take that von Mises stress into that same curve and come up with our epsilon uh, p. All right, so 
what we would do then to find our epsilon sub p that we have in that equation is we would take uh, our sigma e divided by k and uh, take that to the 1 over n power. So let's review what we're going to do here. We're going to find our plastic strains by going 3 halves times the deviatoric stress. We're going to take and we're going to divide that by the equivalent stress from either one of these two forms of the equation. And then we're going to multiply it by this epsilon p term, which has the equivalent stress back in it. We do need to note that epsilon ij that I have written here is a tensor strain. And if we want to have that in terms of uh, what we usually think of as engineering strains, we would have epsilon x uh, p is equal to epsilon 1 1. And likewise, for the other, th other two normal strain components, But when we get to our wanting to calculate our shearing strain, gamma xyp, it's actually two times epsilon 1, 2 plastic and so forth. Let me just write these down. See, so yeah, I need a gamma yz. Let's see. That would be in terms of my subscripts, 1, 3, and a gamma, what, x, z, well, that would be 2, 3 right here. My gamma x, z would be equal to 2 times epsilon, now oh, that one's 1, 3 plastic. In addition to those plastic strains, we also need the elastic strain, so we can calculate our total strains. <clears throat> and that comes through Hooke's Law. So let me write down Hooke's Law for uh, isotropic material. Okay. So here we have uh, epsilon x, elastic, would be equal to sigma x minus nu sigma y plus sigma z all over e, the modulus of elasticity. We have two similar equations or the other two normal strains. And then we have our shearing strain relations. Gamma xy elastic is equal to tau xy over g, the shear modulus. And likewise for these other two. Finally, gamma xz elastic is tau xz over g. And if we're going to assume that we have an isotropic material, we get away with saying that the shear modulus g is equal to e over 2 divided by 1 plus nu. So all we need to do is we need to put these things together. And uh, I have that in a spreadsheet that I will show you right now. OK, so here are my stresses. Uh, maybe let's make this a little bit bigger. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. Uh, here are my stresses. Here's my sigma x or my 1, 1. Here's my tau xy and so forth for all these different stress components. I need my deviatoric stresses. So I computed the trace. The trace is the three normal stresses divided by 3. Here's uh, sigma ij. And here is sij sij. I need to check to see if I have plasticity. Uh, so I have that. 
and uh, here is the sum, here is the root, and this is the von Mises equivalent stress based on, on this formula that we saw on the previous page. Here is my yield stress, and here is the, my von Mises equation that I have, and so I do indeed, using both of those forms of the equation, uh, get the, the appropriate value that I have there. There's my cursor. Okay, so these are both the von Mises stresses. So now uh, what I've got, let's see if I can get over here. Okay, here is my tensor strain, epsilon ijp. Okay, so I take my deviatoric stress right over there. That's the first component, the 1, 1 component and I'm multiplying it by this factor. Uh, let's see what this factor comes from. This is the three halves, the equivalent plastic strain right here. I get that from my ramberg gauss equation using uh, the value of the von Mises stress in there. Uh, L44, let's make sure we understand where that comes from. Okay, right here, yep, right here. Um, and uh, I have this factor then, which is the equation that I showed before. And for each of these, I can compute a plastic strain. Then I have an elastic strain, that's my Hooke's Law equation based on the stresses, not the deviatoric stresses this time, but the full stresses. And then I add these together to get the total strain. And then in this column, I have taken the strains here for the normal strains, and I'm getting the engineering shearing strain by multiplying the tensor shearing strain by two. So these are the values of the uh, total engineering strains for that particular stress state as calculated by J2 flow theory with deformation plasticity. It's very easy. It's very nice when you have uh, the ability to use deformation theory uh, in that uh, you just get the number right at the end. You don't have to do a bunch of little increments and in adding. All right, so let's keep these in mind, and we're going to take the next step where we're going to redo this problem using incremental plasticity, and we have a little bit more work to do so uh, let's break this up uh, into some pieces and we'll, we'll kind of see where we're headed with our incremental theory. All right. Now I'm going to write some, some things down here. Again, uh, I may not have derived them yet uh, on YouTube, but I have in, in the class. By using the normality flow rule, and J2 theory, we can come up with uh, the following expression for plastic strain increments. D epsilon ij plastic is equal to a factor, we're going to call d lambda, s m n d sigma m n divided by two-thirds uh, sigma naught squared times Sij. So plastic strain increments are going to be parallel to the deviatoric stresses, and they have this factor, d lambda. This sigma naught squared, that sigma naught, what that represents um, is something that changes with distance from the origin. the origin of stress space. We'll show you how to do that here in just a second. Oops. All 
All right, so uh, I need to write down our starting stress tensor again. In megapascals, it looks like we had 400 minus 450 and 186. Tau XY is 200, tau XZ is 0, and on my assignment sheet I had a typo that should have, should have said tau ZX, or X, um, excuse me, tau YZ is what it should have said, tau YZ of 80. It's symmetric, so we can fill in the rest of it. Uh, that way. So with yield surface plasticity, we're sitting here at the origin of stress space initially, zero stress and strain, and our, our thought is that we have a surface beyond which uh, we have plasticity and within side of which we have elastic material behavior. This surface is given by the equation SIJ SIJ in dv toric stress space, and that plots out as a nine-dimensional uh, sphere or a hypersphere and we've talked about that in some of the other lectures and videos. Now if I write it this way every point on the surface of that hypersphere will satisfy the condition well, let's see we need to have move the two over here we have the three over here we have the sigma naught squared right here it has to satisfy th this condition of two-thirds sigma naught squared so that means that the radius of that circle is going to be given by square root of 2 over 3 times sigma naught. So we know what that's what that radius is in every direction. What we need to do is take a look at where our uh, stress state will end up. Now I can tell by looking at this number that these numbers are probably going to be beyond our 150 megapascals and beyond the square root of 2 over 3 times 150 megapascals. So I'm pretty sure it's going to yield. I can't draw uh, a surface in nine dimensions, but I'm going to show you in two dimensions schematically how we're going to approach this problem. So this point lands over here somewhere. So this is my stress point. Uh, sigma, uh, well, it's my stress point S that is derived from sigma. So I guess let's be a little bit careful here. So this is S, which happens to be equal to sigma uh, minus hydrostatic stress times Kronecker delta IJ. I guess I should write it as the identity tensor that way. where P is equal to one-third of the trace of sigma. And so as we get to this point, since we're initially centered on the surface, we're traveling all the way out here to this particular point. But there is some point of intersection uh, that will get us exactly on that yield surface. We're going to talk about the radial return technique. So if this is my S, then there's some amount of this I'm going to call beta times S that will exactly place us on the yield surface. Well, that beta times S goes over here. So it's going to be beta SIJ, beta SIJ, where SIJ is a deviatoric stress that corresponds to this stress state. That's going to be equal to two-thirds sigma naught squared, where sigma naught right now is our 150 megapascals that we have up here. So if we group these like terms, we can see that beta squared is going to be equal to two-thirds sigma naught squared divided by Sij Sij. 
and you know we'll take the square root of both sides and uh, have that equation right there. Now we can throw out the negative root, the negative roots on the other side of the yield surface and we need to have our vector pointing in the right direction so we're going to take that positive root. Okay so we're going to have to calculate then use a black I guess we're going to have to calculate how much stress goes right here so once I have beta sigma on the surface is equal to the beta times my original sigma that I have up here and then I can calculate my deviatoric stress state that corresponds to the stress on the surface and I can also calculate elastic strains that correspond to the stress state on the surface, on that yield surface. Okay, so again, that goes with this quantity, the beta times the sigma. All right, so that's our setup. Let's take a look at the spreadsheet. This one's a little bit more complicated. So here's my stress tensor, here's my stress, uh, trace, here's my deviatoric stresses. Uh, you see this very similar to the same spreadsheet I had before. And so here is uh, this two-thirds sigma naught squared quantity right here. Here's my schematic, uh, just like I showed you. Here's my calculation for beta. I got uh, 0.176 something. So it's about 17.6% of that total sigma. So I take 17.6% of that and that will get me directly on the yield surface. Okay, here's that right here. So this is where I'm going to end. I need, know I need to get to these values of stress and proportional loading path. This is what I'm starting with. Okay, I'm starting with these values right here. So here it is. Here's the beta times the sigma ij. Let's see where that beta is at again. Uh, it's up here. So when I highlight the cell, it's got the beta times the sigma ij. Probably need to zoom in on this one a little bit too. Uh, I'll make the spreadsheet available and you can take a look at it. All right, so. There's where I'm starting from. There's the corresponding deviatoric stress that goes with this. Here's my elastic strains in uh, tensor form using Hooke's Law again. There's a 3D Hooke's Law again. And here's my engineering strains uh, accounting for two times this for the shearing strain terms. Okay, now what I want to do uh, let me uh, make a little bit of room here. And now what I want to do is I want to start right here on the surface and I want to make a bunch of little increments until I end up at my final position. And I want to calculate the corresponding plastic strains according to my incremental theory. So let's talk about our equations again. I had this written out on the other page, but I just wrote it down again. The epsilon ij plastic, the again tensor plastic strain increments, is equal to a d lambda term. We'll talk about that in a second. S m n d sigma m n. We are using um, summation notation, so that those are deviatoric stresses times stress increments, dotted with s i uh, times s i j. Um, SIJ is our deviatoric stress 
divided by 2 thirds sigma naught squared, where the sigma naught squared depends on how far away we are from the origin or stress space. d lambda is equal to 3 halves 1 over h, where 1 over h is 1 over the plastic tangent modulus. h is the plastic tangent modulus on the stress versus plastic strain curve. It is the slope at a particular level of stress. Right? At that particular level of stress, um, the plastic tangent modulus is d sigma over d epsilon p. For ramberg osgood material, we can calculate that in a closed form. It's k times n sigma over k to the n minus 1 over n. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with our starting stress state. Okay, that corresponds to a deviatoric stress state that's right here on the yield surface. And we're going to end at our final resting stress state. And this is going to be corresponding to our delta sigma, this portion, from here to here. And that delta sigma, that's the ending stress minus the starting stress, we're going to break up into a number of increments. And so our d sigmas, uh, we're going to do 100 increments. And for homework, I have you had you do um, 10, 100, 1,000 increments and see where you kind of got convergence. But we're going to take this delta sigma, and we're going to divide that by 100 to get d sigma. Now, when we're at the starting stress, we need to calculate the corresponding elastic strains. All right, so we need to calculate those elastic strains that correspond to that starting stress state. And then for every increment of stress, we're going to have our new stress is going to be equal to our previous stress plus our d sigma. Our new strains are going to be equal to our uh, previous strains plus our d epsilon, which is going to be made up of two parts, a d epsilon elastic plus d epsilon plastic. And the d epsilon elastic is going to be calculated by 3d Hooke's law. We have to account for uh, tensor strains, and our d epsilon plastic is going to be calculated by our equation that we have up here. Okay, so this is going to get a little bit complicated on the spreadsheet, but uh, I think you can kind of see uh, how all of this needs to be pieced together in order for us to calculate our plastic strains. Now, we're not so worried at this stage about our yield surface. Uh, the calculations that we're going to do right now are going to hold for isotropic loading and uh, or kinematic uh, isotropic hardening or kinematic hardening. It depends on whether that uh, yield surface follows with us or expands to get to that final point. Since this is a proportional loading path, things are a little bit easier. We're eventually going to want to do kinematic hardening for the fourth problem on your exam, uh, but for now uh, we're going to going to just calculate the plastic strains, and then, uh, then we'll have to position the yield surface after we get to that point. All right, so let's look at the spreadsheet. This one, like I said, is going to be a little complicated. And hopefully I got everything right in here. The results I got looked pretty good, um, but uh, we'll, we'll check. All right, so this column is our starting stress. Or excuse me, our final stress is where we want to get to. This is the beta that I calculated times that stress. Okay, this will be our starting point. And I know I want to end up over here, and so my big delta stress is this value, and my d sigmas are this value. Now, these are not deviatoric stresses. These are just regular stresses. All right. So these are my equations. I just put them in here, and uh, it says look right for the work. Let's come over here. Uh, now this is all in one giant row uh, that I put this in, and 
this can be condensed, but you know I'm trying to uh, explain how all this works, so I have uh, everything listed here uh, fairly explicitly. Okay, so these values are my starting stresses. I know these values, uh, these are my stress tensor components. I know these will put me right on the yield surface. Here's the corresponding hydrostatic stress for that stress state, and this next section is my corresponding deviatoric stress. I'm starting out uh, in the deviatoric stress space in that figure. My stress increment, this is my d sigma, uh, is that number over 100, and that stays constant for all my calculations. My deviatoric stress increment stays constant for all those calculations. In fact, uh, I don't think I need this term, uh, but I put that in here anyway. Okay, now here's, uh, here's my term. S M N D sigma M N. Uh, now I didn't do the sum, uh, but uh, uh, when I sum these, then I will have that uh, expanded index notation term. So this term, let's check this out, should be S one one times D sigma one one. Okay. S11, there's my deviatoric stress, 11 right here, times my stress increment D sigma 11. All right. So that's that term. Uh, let's see where I'm at. Okay. All right. I need my von Mises stress. We showed how to do that on the previously. It's the square root of. 3 halves SIJ SIJ. Okay. So that should go back to my deviatoric terms. Let's see if I can find them. Here they are. Here is my plastic tangent modulus. Now we're going to come back, we're going to discuss the results, and, and we're going to see why this plastic tangent modulus. Um, may need to be adjusted a little bit. But what I'm doing is I'm taking my current value of Mises stress, which is the 150.95, um, and there, there's a little bit of rounding in there. That should be 150 exactly. Um, I might want to check, see if I can do a better calculation on that. Um, but uh, I put that into the the H calculation that I showed before. Okay, so this should be K times N sigma over K to the N minus 1 over N. Okay, now I have a factor. Okay, so this is the 3 halves. And then I have uh, 1 over H. And I have uh, the 2 thirds sigma naught squared. BK101, oh, yep, that's that value right here. Um, let's look and see what that value is. BL101, let's just check that. Uh, okay, that's the plastic tangent modulus. Okay, and then I have that term times this quantity, and this is SMN D sigma MN. There should be nine terms there, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Okay, so this is what I call my factor. And I need to take that, and I need to take that factor and multiply it by my deviatoric stress component. So that should go, and now let's just check this, should be all the way back here at uh, this one. Okay, so I do need that deviatoric stress. Uh, right there. I don't need the deviatoric stress increment, I guess. Okay. So I now have my tensor plastic strains. I have my tensor elastic strain increments, and I can calculate with Hooke's law. I can add my elastic and plastic to get my total strain increments, and now uh, I can also then get my engineering total strain increments. But what I really want is the strain added on 
to my starting strain. Okay, so in green I have right here my starting strain increments. I just copied those values. And uh, this one is just taking this one times uh, that starting strain. And now the next one is taking the previous one uh, plus the currently calculated strain. All right, so I go down here. And I can go through 100 increments. Make sure I get my, my ending stress. Okay, after 100 increments, okay, I started with 1, so i got to go to 101. I have uh, my reached my final stress state. Let's see where I'm at for my strains. Um, now here I have um, this extra increment, so I think really I need to be looking at these values. I'll let you take a look at that for me. But uh, here is 0.16926. Let me copy those values that I had from the Hinkey equations onto a new spreadsheet so we can see these a little bit more easily. Okay, so over here on the left side I have the total strains from Hinky and over here on the right I have uh, our incremental where we summed everything up. And let's look at this one. Let me highlight it in a different color here. It's kind of bright. Okay, 0 .1, 0 0.0167. Here I have 0 .0169. Uh, 0 0.0188. Here I have 0 0.01 uh, 9, 8, and, and so forth. And if you notice, these uh, values in this row are just a little bit uh, higher. Looks like I might, maybe I made a mistake somewhere on, on this one. I can, I'll have to check that out. Um, 0 0.075. So let me, uh, I might have an error in one of my equations here. Um, but um, if you notice, these values look a little bit higher than the strains calculated with deformation theory plasticity. Let's explain why that might be. Okay, so when I start off with an increment, I have a finite increment. Okay, so maybe I'm moving from this stress level to this equivalent stress level. I'm using the stiffness uh, right here, I'm using this initial tangent stiffness. And that may be a little bit too steep. So if this is a curve that kind of continue, continuously curves over, it may be a situation, and here I'll kind of exaggerate that. I'm using the, the infinitesimal stiffness. So like if I exaggerate it and if I go from here to here, I would use this uh, curve in between these two points, but I'm using the uh, the derivative tangent uh, analytically, and that may be very stiff right here. It may be stiffer than the actual slope that goes in between these two points. So I, I think I'm over stiffening it just a little bit. So what you what you might do instead is if you know you're starting at this point, uh, let me use a different color. If you know you're starting at this point and you know you're ending at this point, maybe you want to use uh, a plastic tangent calculation using the point that's halfway in between. And so that can kind of smooth out and, and give you a little bit um, less of that overly stiff response. The other thing you can do is you can just use tons more increments. Now you saw we were pretty close, um, you know, within a few percent uh, either way. but um, but it is just a little bit stiff. All right, so this is kind of a lengthy example. I know uh, it just takes a while to set all this up. I'm going to see if I can track down what my error might have been, either in the deformation theory equations or in the incremental plasticity on that very last term. I have a feeling I, I just, uh, probably with the elastic strains, I, I may have gotten something calculated wrong. I'll try to track that down, and I'll try to upload the spreadsheet either to my personal website or um, put it on our, our box account at the university. All right.
the next step after this then is to continue this process with two additional stress states in kinematic hardening. So with our exam, we're gonna we're gonna go here and we're gonna look at these next two stress states. We're gonna have to evaluate unloading conditions, traversing the kinematic yield surface, restarting up our plastic increment till we get to this final stress state here, and then doing the same thing for this next step. So there's a little bit of work, but we still do all of this with a spreadsheet. We just have to, to work all of this out.